I'm not sure how we ended up throwing that damn party because I despised them so much. The guest of honor was Harrington Gibbs. He was so wealthy that I couldn't imagine marrying my wife, Cindy Harrington. Cindy and Gail had known each other for three years at Cornell. Harrington went to Oxford, and Gail and I stayed to carry on Cornell's traditions, whatever that meant. In fact, I only met Gail after Harrington had left. They broke up, agreeing to see other people. I earned a master's degree in business administration, and Gail and I married, had two children, and have lived happily ever after to this day. Harrington Gibbs returned after 20 years, richer and more appealing than before. Grace and Harry Jr. left for college, leaving us with the infamous empty nest. Gail was overjoyed when Harrington announced his return. We hadn't seen each other since college. I knew she still had feelings for him in various ways. This annoyed me greatly, but I tried not to express my displeasure. I wasn't as handsome or rich as Harrington, but I was her husband. My main complaint was what happened in the bedroom several times when we had really intense sex. Gail shouted his name. Nothing ruins hot sex like a woman calling you by another man's name in the throes of passion. It got to the point where I was paranoid about being called Gibby while riding with my wife. She never understood why I lost interest in her during our wonderful romp. I never explained it to her. So here we are, throwing a party for my wife's former lover, whom she fantasizes about while I ring her bells. How could I not hate this man? There were only about 20 people, which was more than enough for me. It was a warm summer evening, and we gathered outside by the pool. I grilled several dishes so that guests could choose their food throughout the evening. I tried not to get in the way, playing the role of a shy, reserved host. Of course, Harrington was the center of attention, and to top it off, he arrived in his new yellow Lamborghini. He boasted not only about his car, but also about the $500,000 price tag that accompanied it. Everyone gathered to look at the car, and most of the ladies, including Gail, decided to take a ride. When the guests left, I, like a good husband, started collecting empty bottles and dirty dishes. Finally, only Gail Harrington and I remained. Oh, did I mention Gail had invited Harrington to spend the night with us? We had plenty of space because the children were away at college. Surprise, surprise. Why don't you all sit down and I'll fix you something tasty in the evening? I believe we've had enough beer, Gib. Do you want a Tom Collins? I cringed as she called him that. I felt immediately humiliated. He smiled and nodded. I swear he smirked in my direction. Harry, I'll get you a gin and tonic and a salty dog for me. You two should just relax a little. It has been a long day. I will be back in a few moments. Harrington, Gibbs, and I sat silently. I had no topics to discuss with him, in search of a way to relieve boredom. I claimed that I had to disconnect the propane tank from the grill. Harrington used the opportunity to ensure that his yellow bird was locked up for the night, as he approached the garage. I occupied myself with the grill grates. The garages were separate from the house which my father had always insisted on while I was removing the first tank. I looked through the kitchen window. Gail was walking down the hallway towards the kitchen, holding a small bottle in her hand. I paused what I was doing and watched as she opened the bottle and removed three small capsules. It was a bottle of Ambien, as prescribed for me. Ambien was an extremely effective sleep aid. One capsule was enough to keep me asleep for at least ten hours. I watched my wife open three capsules and pour them into my gin and tonic. Harrington was returning from the garage, so I finished my task and we both returned to our comfortable lounge chairs, just as Gail brought out our drinks. Gail and Harrington were giddy. Spend the next few minutes reminiscing about their college years. Of course, I had no idea who or where they were talking about, so I pretended to be interested while sipping my gin and tonic. It was difficult to drink the beverage without spilling the ice, but I succeeded when the beverage was finished. I noticed Gail and Harrington exchanging glances. I purposefully began to lose interest in their conversation and closed my eyes with a final fake gesture. I drained my nightcap, placed the empty glass on the table, and settled into the lounge chair. I swear I heard Gail giggle. They waited at least twenty minutes before carefully lifting and carrying me to the bedroom. As they removed my shoes, I made some incoherent sounds that made Gail laugh once more. Ten minutes later, I was on my feet and completely sober. I was astounded at how focused and determined I felt. I put my shoes back on and proceeded down the hallway. 
Gale and Harrington were in Grace's room, and the sounds they made left no doubt about what they were doing. For a moment I wondered if Gale had accidentally called him Harry. I could easily walk into the room and end everything right there and then, but that would be no fun. When I arrived at the garage, I was unsure what I was going to do. I wanted to get the Lamborghini out of the garage, but it was locked and I didn't have the keys. The sunroof was open, so I reached inside to unlock the driver's door. Even though I could do the job, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I began with three old cans of lighter fluid. I no longer had a charcoal grill. Two cans were placed inside and one on the roof. I opened the trunk in the hood for easier access. God, this car was gorgeous. I had a gallon of paint thinner in the engine compartment, along with a couple of cans of Coleman fuel. I walked around the garage. I was surprised by the treasures I discovered. There was half a gallon of kerosene on the back seat. The interior of the trunk was sprayed with an almost empty can of turpentine. I poured a gallon of muriatic acid onto the car's roof, which made little sense because I was going to burn it anyway. To top it off, I threw in a small box of leftover fireworks, primarily Roman candles and rockets. It would have been a shame to lose Gale's Volvo wagon in my Jeep Liberty, but it was worthwhile. I tossed a lit flare from the doorway at the far end of the garage. It took me less than a minute to get back into the house and upstairs to the bedroom. Inside, the garage was decorated for Christmas. Gale and Harrington were still busy with their activities when I passed by their room. I took four Ambien capsules out of the bottle and swallowed them at the last minute. I took one more. I wanted it to look as if I had overdosed. I lay down on the bed and began quietly laughing to myself. The next thing I remember is someone shining a flashlight in my eyes and muttering something about how he's alive. He is alive. There was a lot of commotion as they carried me out of the house and into the ambulance. I was conscious enough to notice that someone had cut a hole in my throat and inserted something into it. I realized I couldn't swallow and it smelled like an old Boy Scout campfire. I recall the smell. Something was burning. There were cops, firefighters, and paramedics. Someone stuck a needle into my arm. Grace and Harry Jr. were sitting in my room when I awoke. I peeked with one eye to see what was going on and saw them. What is going on, guys? Dad, you are awake. Hold on, I will get the nurse. Harry left the room, and Grace approached and sat next to me. How do you feel? I'm feeling lousy. What happened? I knew exactly what had happened, but I was unable to tell anyone. You took too many sleeping pills. You had a bad reaction that nearly killed you. What the hell are you talking about? I haven't taken a sleeping pill in weeks. Grace looked surprised when I said that. The nurse who returned with Harry smiled widely. Well, Mr. Crenshaw, you look a lot better than you did last night. What the hell has happened to me? The best we can say is that you took too many pills that didn't agree with you. I did not take any pills. Last night, I drank a few beers and a gin and tonic. That is it. My nurse simply tilted her head to the side and gave me a strange expression. What exactly did they find in me? What pills? She grabbed the card lying at the foot of the bed and quickly flipped through it. It says here that you took Zolpidem. What is that in English? Sleeping pills? I have a prescription for sleeping pills, but I did not take any last night. Mr. Crenshaw, I believe you should speak with someone else about this. I am not in a position to discuss it with you. I'm glad you're looking better. I will inform the doctor. Grace returned to the bed and Harry left with the nurse. How did you all get here? Mom called Harry and he picked me up on the way home. By the way, where is your mother? Shouldn't she be here? She's speaking with the police about the fire. What fire? Was I sleeping during a fire? The garage burned to the ground. The house is fine. Was anyone hurt? It's just you. I hate to admit it, but I'm a little confused. I looked out the window of the room into the hall. Harry and the nurse were speaking to a tall man dressed in a dark suit. They appeared to be gesturing a lot, but they were not arguing. Do you want any water? I heard her, but did not respond. Dad, would you like some water? Oh yes, of course, I would love some water. It was warm water with a drinking straw, at least it was wet. There was a bandage on my throat and I assumed someone had made an airway. I had a small plastic tube delivering oxygen to my nose and I was feeling relatively well. My throat was sore. It felt raw, like hamburger meat, and I held four in my right hand. A tall man in a suit had just entered the room when the doctor appeared. After a brief conversation, the man in the suit left Dr. Anthem to check my heart and blood pressure, but he seemed most concerned with my breathing. 
Excessive Ambien use can cause severe swelling of the tongue and throat. He looked concerned when I assured him that I had not taken any sleeping pills. As you might expect, the doctor gave me a shot to put me to sleep before leaving. Grace and Harry promised to return the next day and then left in the morning. My throat felt better before noon. They disconnected all of the monitoring and support equipment. Apparently, my recovery was proceeding well. Good morning, Mr. Crenshaw. I'm Naranja, the detective. Are you prepared to answer a few questions this morning? Who was the tall man wearing the dark suit? My eyes must have watered as I was still not fully awake. I swung my legs off the bed and went to the bathroom. The bedpan was no longer being used. My voice sounded rough, like a horse's whinny, but I didn't mind. It felt good. My throat was sore, which I took as a sign of healing. So, Mr. Noronha, how can I help you? You seem to be feeling better. Could you explain what happened last Saturday night? What day is today? Today is Tuesday? Well, damn. When you're having fun, time seems to fly by. He tried to laugh, but didn't quite succeed. Mr. I mean, Detective Neuron, the last thing I remember from the Saturday party was cleaning up and drinking with my wife and Mr. Gibbs. We were sitting in lounge chairs on the patio. I'm not sure where the paramedics or anyone else found me. Mr. Crenshaw, the police found you. They discovered you unconscious on your bed. Sorry, I can't even remember going to bed. You did not? Your wife claimed you passed out from drinking too much. She and Mr. Gibbs carried you into the bedroom. That is ridiculous. I drank three beers all evening and a gin and tonic before bed. Three beers in five hours won't make you blackout drunk. You weren't drunk. We checked your alcohol level when you were brought in, Mr. Crenshaw. It was so low that you would not even be charged with DUI. Why would she say that unless it was true? It's complicated, Mr. Crenshaw. I will try to explain, but you must listen to me. Detective Naranja and I sat quietly for a few moments. I had a lot of questions I wanted to ask him, but I was also afraid he'd have a lot of questions for me. Detective Naranja, was there a fire in my house that night? I seem to remember firefighters being present when they took me away. Yes, your garage and the three cars inside were destroyed by fire. You know nothing about it. He asked the question in a shy tone, almost as if he was teasing me. Of course I knew. I tried to respond accordingly. The last thing I remember is how good it felt to stretch out in the lounge chair after the party had ended. Mr. Crenshaw, the arson investigators will be here later to speak with you. But I have a small question about the fire. Did you keep any flammable materials in your garage? Yes, that is why I had the garage built separate from the main house. My father was always afraid of garage fires, and I believe I inherited that trait from him. The house was not damaged, was it? No. The fire was contained to the garage. Do you have any idea how it started? Oh, yes. There's no denying it was arson. Someone purposefully started the fire for some reason. I probably should have been a little more sensible about the whole thing. But at the time, I didn't mind. Hell, I'm still not sure I care. I suppose someone did not enjoy the party. My witty remark made him smirk, implying that he did not find my comment amusing. So, Detective Naronha, if this is a fire department job, why are you here? Mr. Crenshaw, you didn't take any sleeping pills the night of the party, right? No, I didn't need them. The hospital performed a complete examination due to your condition. When you were brought inside, there was some alcohol in your system, but not enough to cause problems. They discovered that you had been administered a large dose of sleeping pills. You had a sleeping pill prescription, which was discovered in your medicine cabinet. I haven't taken those sleeping pills in several weeks. I only take them when I have work issues. What did you mean when you said I received a large dose, Mr. Crenshaw? After everyone had left, our team searched the house and discovered a glass that had apparently been used for gin and tonic. The laboratory discovered traces of sleeping pills at the bottom of the glass. My wife prepared that drink for me. Detective Naranja did not respond. He simply sat quietly, as if waiting for a different response from me. My wife drugged me. I decided that a direct question would elicit a direct response. He nodded yes, but said nothing. Do you know for certain, or is this just a guess? Your wife initially denied it, but she confessed after Mr. Gibbs told us the entire story. Are you claiming that Harrington Gibbs and my wife conspired to drug me? Why? That question made Detective Naranja squirm slightly in his chair. 
He was conducting a professional investigation, but he appeared hesitant to tell me that my wife had drugged me in order to have sex with another man. I chose to let him off the hook. Never mind. I believe I know the answer. I sincerely regret it. Mr. Crenshaw, it is always difficult to communicate this type of information to the affected spouse. We sat silently again. I guess that's why she hasn't come to see me. Where is she now? Your wife is at her parents' house. Her father posted bail for her. Will there be a trial? No. Harrington Gibbs told us everything we needed to know in order to receive a lighter sentence. In fact, his lawyers almost got all of the charges against him dropped. He blamed everything on your wife for planning and carrying it out. He claimed to have no idea what she was doing until it was all over. You do not believe that, do you? No, but he does have excellent lawyers. What happens to Gail? She admitted to everything and consented to whatever. The court decides to avoid the publicity associated with a trial. What exactly has she been charged with? Honestly, I'm not sure right now. I believe the responsible officials change their minds on a regular basis. But I'm not sure they'd be interested in hearing how you feel about all of this. Did you phrase it as a question, which I found intriguing? I believe that is something I should discuss with her. But I am willing to drop all charges if she agrees to a quick, no-fault divorce. That may help, but she will still face civil charges, even if you let her off the hook. She has committed a crime and must face the consequences. Let us see what you can do for her. Okay. I will contact my lawyer as soon as I can. How about the fire? He shrugged and rose from his chair. I suppose I'll have to wait until I speak with the fire department staff. And the same day. Harry Jr. checked me out of the hospital and drove me home. He arranged for a few days off from school to help me settle in, but it turned out that I didn't require any assistance. I was fully capable of managing on my own. We spent a few minutes inspecting the fire damage, but did not discuss it with Jill. It felt awkward for him. Seymour Schlapp, my favorite lawyer, arrived, and within two hours we had drafted a divorce agreement. I gave Gail the house and furniture as well as half of our money, after deducting the college tuition prepayment. Given the tuition costs, there was little left before Seymour left. I also advised him to file a $1 million lawsuit against Harrington for emotional distress. Seymour was delighted to oblige, knowing he would receive 22% of whatever he collected. My rental car arrived at the same time. A representative from Papa John's brought me dinner. There was still plenty of beer remaining from the party. My lovely wife arrived before I could finish my dinner. She didn't enter but rang the doorbell. I found that interesting. I cleared the kitchen table so that we could talk. Harry, I feel foolish saying this, but I apologize for everything that occurred. It was a stupid action on my part with a stupid reason. I can't undo it. What exactly are you apologizing for? Drugging me or sleeping with Harrington? She did not cry, but her eyes were filled with tears. Her response was inadequate and unclear. Both. I poured myself another beer. I looked at Gail and she shook her head, indicating that she did not want any. Gail, why are you here? Mostly to clarify what happened, but also to discuss the divorce. Let's tackle the divorce first. What do you want? I don't need the house or the furniture. You can keep the remainder of the money. This will leave you with nothing. I can't afford the mortgage and don't want to think about having to sell it. I'll probably be gone for a few years and won't be able to use it anyway. Okay? I will ask Seymour to change it. Anything else? No. Simply make it as quick and painless as possible. Are you certain you don't want a beer? No. Harry, I am sorry about Harrington. It was wrong, and there are no excuses for it. There must be a reason. I've thought about it a lot. Harrington and I have always gotten along. We were friends and understood one another. The sex was always enjoyable, not only good, but incredible. So what about us? Harry, we made love. Give me. And I did not do that. We just had sex. I realize it sounds like a tired cliche, but it's true. Sometimes we made love. It felt so good that I found myself repeating his name. I knew when it happened, and I've always felt awkward about it. It was a reflex I couldn't control. So you believe I was the better lover, but Harrington was the better sexual partner? It sounds ridiculous when you put it like that. But yes. Were you planning on leaving with him? Oh, no. He was incredible in bed. But I wouldn't agree to live with him. You were an ideal husband, father, and provider. I'd never give it up. But you gave it up. Now she was in tears. It was restrained. But these were tears. It's been 20 years since Gabby and I were together. 
I wanted to feel the thrill of shameless sex once more before we reached our golden years. We are only in our forties. What the hell are you talking about? I was unsure whether I'd ever see him again. Now you're just saying nonsense. You can talk about all the ridiculous reasons you did it, but it won't change anything. You cheated. It is crystal clear. I really do not want to hear any more. Are you done? Yes, I am done. I will not bother you anymore. But I know it was you. What does this mean? You destroyed the garage by setting it on fire. You set everything up. I cannot blame you. You were completely justified in everything you did. But you actually did it. You weren't simply a victim. We have been married for nearly 25 years, and I know you better than you realize. Are you saying that I set you up? You and I both know this. What did you tell the police? Nothing. Do you believe me? You played the victim so well that I didn't have a chance. I finished my beer, leaned back in my chair, and smiled at her. No way was I going to admit anything. Harry, how did you know Harrington and I were having sex? What if you were unconscious in the bedroom? I sat there, a silly smile on my face. When the paramedics removed you from the house, you were in your shoes when Jimmy and I put you to bed. I took off your shoes. How did you get them back on? Harry? This keen observation caused me to shrug and smile. You did not drink the gin and tonic I served you. You knew there was something in it. You tricked us into thinking you drank everything. But you didn't, did you? I stood up and threw the empty bottle in the trash. You knew I'd have sex with Harrington and did nothing to prevent it. What kind of husband allows his wife to have sex with another man? What if he can stop it? Her tearful demeanor changed to arrogance. It was unattractive. Okay, now I get it. It's entirely my fault because I didn't stop you. You planned the entire thing to have an orgy with your ex-boyfriend, and it's now my fault because I didn't stop you. The arrogance faded as quickly as it appeared. Oh my God, did I say that? I did not mean it, did I? I'm very sorry, Harry. I did not mean that when I said it. I was not thinking. I didn't mean it, in all honesty. I got up from the table and walked out of the room. I turned slightly to look at her. I think you should leave. I've had enough comfort for the day. As I entered the bedroom, I heard her cry. A few moments later, I heard the front door shut. Three months later, I was alone. I sold the house but received no monetary compensation. Gill was sentenced to three years in prison for conspiracy to commit a crime, but the term was suspended. Upon my recommendation, she currently lives with her parents and works at a local bank. Harrington was more than willing to settle the lawsuit for $500,000. Somehow I ended up with less than $400,000. I now understand why Seymour smiled. Harrington fled to his estate in Cornwall, where he raises polo ponies. I do not believe he ever contacted the girl again. After everything was settled, I was able to schedule a transfer to Dallas. Grace and Harry Jr. remained close to their mother, but I have not spoken with her since the trial. Here is the next story. The intercom awakened me. My secretary informed me that a lady had insisted on seeing me personally and urgently. I rinsed my face to wake up and went to my private office looking down at the city below with disdain. I despise the place and the people who work on the 17 floors beneath me. Despite the fact that they were all my employees, Colette, my secretary, entered without knocking because I was rarely present. I was just a figurehead, living in my penthouse with nowhere else to go. A young woman walked in with a sense of importance but appeared uneasy in the grand setting. She introduced herself as June Parsons of Slough's Social Services, attempting to keep things informal. She appeared out of place and unprepared for my environment. June explained that her case involved two children and a mother who attempted suicide, handing me a letter discovered next to the mother. The letter began. My dear John, I recognized the handwriting right away, flashing back 11 years to when my life changed dramatically. I have vivid memories of that chaotic morning. A burst water main on Chiswick High Road caused a massive traffic jam, leaving me nearly an hour and a half late. My secretary caught me sneaking into the office, scolding me for my dead phone and informing me that Tony Jordan had attempted to contact me. I didn't want to meet with him because he and his brother had no idea how to manage contracts or keep customers satisfied. Tony informed me that there was a problem with the Johnson job and that I needed to fly out immediately to settle things with their board and prevent them from taking their business elsewhere. He was confident that I could handle it like I had before. Internally, 
I resented Tony and his brother Robert for mismanaging the company, but I knew that expressing this would jeopardize my job. Tony insisted I take a noon flight because Simon Johnson had retired and his nephew, Paul Johnson, was now in charge. He dismissed my plans to go to the theater with my wife, Sally, putting the Johnson account ahead of my personal life. I protested about having to cancel my commitment to Sally, but Tony insisted, claiming Sally would understand the significance of the Johnson account, which accounted for nearly half of our revenue. He suggested calling her to pack my belongings because there wasn't enough time for me to get home before the flight. I left his office, thinking about how I began working for Henry Jordan right out of college when the company was a smaller operation. Henry had navigated difficult times under Maggie Thatcher's policies, saving the company while others failed. During difficult times, Henry Jordan took advantage of surplus machinery by repairing it and selling it to developing countries at inflated prices. A typical Tory, he most likely kept profits offshore to avoid taxes as bankruptcies declined. Henry shifted his focus to becoming a middleman for companies selling machine tools in Europe, assembling and delivering machines throughout the EEC. The company thrived until Henry's two sons, Tony and Robert, joined despite their university degrees. Their just-in-time approach resulted in delays because they failed to account for unexpected issues in our line of work. Simple planning could have prevented these issues, but they insisted on tight deadlines which frequently resulted in late deliveries and dissatisfied customers. Tony insisted that I fly to New York to resolve the Johnson job issue, despite the fact that it was their responsibility. I complied, knowing that the board would blame me if something went wrong. I called Sally at the Slough factory to let her know. She also worked for Jordan and Sons, so I knew we'd be in trouble if things went wrong. Sally and I met several years ago when she joined the typing pool. We married four months later and spent ten happy years together at home. Work was going well until Henry's sons took over, which disrupted the company dynamics. Before they arrived, I was Henry's right-hand man, helping him with everything. Their arrival changed everything. Henry was a decent man who did not immediately prioritize his sons over me, but they resented it. They were polite, but I could tell they didn't like how much influence I had over their father. Henry Jordan took the company public making a lot of money, but not giving me any shares or a directorship. When Henry had a heart attack, he asked me to look after his sons. However, I lacked influence without shares. Henry retired and died three months later, and his sons made unwelcome changes, such as relocating offices to Chiswick and putting Robert in charge of the factory with Sally as secretary. I didn't like Sally working for Robert, suspecting jealousy or mistrust of the brothers. Sally got along well with Robert and often defended him, which caused tension between us because I traveled frequently for work. Robert spent more time with Sally, which created friction. Sally was upset because she thought I had volunteered for the trip. She made a scene, but I tried to explain the urgency, but she was upset by my frequent absences. Sally arrived late at the airport, which created tension. She remained distant, encouraging me to concentrate on my work. The check-in clerk then stated, Mr. Parsons, you must check your bag in now or it will not make it onto your flight. I quickly finished checking the bag and returned to find Sally, but she was gone. How long until the flight is called? I asked the clerk. Probably half an hour. I would stay in the departure area. I dashed in the direction Sally had come, but she had already vanished, indicating she was moving quickly. I noticed the entrance to a bridge leading to short-term parking at the end of the concourse. I was halfway across the bridge when I noticed a bright yellow Lamborghini leave the parking lot below. I could barely see Sally's coat through the passenger side window. I knew Robert Jordan was driving, even though I couldn't see him. Robert never allowed anyone else to drive his flashy car. I was infuriated. Robert Jordan couldn't make it to New York, but he did have time to drive my wife around in his fancy car. I was fuming as I walked back into the terminal. I visited the bar, which was unusual for me, and ordered a drink. After about 20 minutes of stewing, my flight was called, and I proceeded to the departure lounge. On the flight, I went through the contracts, looking for the usual loopholes Henry had included to give us some leeway with delivery dates. However, the Jordan brothers handled the most recent contracts, and the majority of those useful loopholes were no longer present. When I arrived at JFK, Paul Johnson was there to greet me along with Petra, 
his PA, and a group of yes-men. I had met Paul several times before. He always appeared to be much younger than me, despite the fact that I am only about five years older. Usually Simon Johnson did the majority of the talking, while Paul simply nodded and laughed at his jokes. But Paul's overly enthusiastic greeting and his entourage of helpers carrying my bags to the waiting limo made me nervous. We've reserved you a room in the company suite at the WA, Paul said. Simon had hoped to meet you during this trip, but he's still on his world cruise. He asked me to inform you that he will visit you when his ship docks in Southampton. I found it odd that Simon Johnson wanted to meet with me. Sure, I had always gotten along with him. Henry Jordan and I had many interactions over the years, but it was always professional. Now that he was retired, why would he want to see me? Henry Jordan always stayed at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. Personally, I prefer less flashy places, but Paul told me the suite was the company's suite, so I assumed it was simply available. I couldn't imagine the Jordan brothers paying for a suite solely for me. After dropping me off at the Waldorf Astoria, Paul said he'd send Petra to pick me up for dinner around 7 p.m. Then he and his entourage left. The entire journey was becoming more confusing by the minute. I should have invited Paul Johnson to dinner, not the other way around. It was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, local time. I wondered if Sally had attended the play alone because she had the tickets. When I called our home number, there was no answer. Assume it was around 9 p.m. In London, I texted her to see how she was enjoying the play and who she went with. When Petra arrived to pick me up, I was still on the telephone. I had not heard from Sally and there was still no answer at home. I left a message on the answering machine saying I was going out to dinner and would call her the following day. As I was about to leave, Petra took my briefcase from me and returned it to where I had picked it up. This evening is only for socializing. John Paul invites you to meet his family. He said it was a shame you didn't bring your wife along. Petra, what is going on? I asked her when we were in the car. I could tell Petra was thinking about how to respond to my question, and she took a moment before speaking. Paul believes that because you two conduct so much business together, you should get to know each other better. He also wants you to meet the entire Johnson board. None of this made sense to me until I considered whether Johnson and partners were interested in hiring me away from Jordan and Sons. That seemed to be the only explanation for the strange behavior. The dinner was fantastic and many of Johnson's board members and their spouses attended. Then we went to a nightclub where some people danced. I did not participate because I was experiencing jet lag. I'd been awake for several hours more than everyone else. As the evening progressed, I became increasingly convinced that my theory about being headhunted might be correct. All of the board members made an effort to talk to me and make me feel welcome. Petra remained close, almost acting as my personal assistant. Whenever someone approached me, she would quietly tell me who they were and any relevant information about them. Around 2 a.m., New York time, and 7 a.m. at home. I returned to my room. My phone had no messages, and the hotel receptionist confirmed that Sally had also not left any. I considered calling her, but decided it was too early because she had stayed out late the night before. I was jolted awake at 11 a.m. Petra brought me breakfast and informed me about my schedule. Your board meeting is at noon, followed by a round of golf with Paul. We'll take a helicopter to Serge's estate right after. Paul also wants to know if you're in a hurry to return to London. It depends on what Paul and the board decide regarding our delays. I'm sure they will accept whatever you say. They trust you, but hurry. You do not want to be late to the meeting. Petra appeared flustered and left quickly. I attempted to call Sally, but discovered she was not in her office. The temporary receptionist did not recognize my voice or ask any questions, but she had no idea where Sally was. On a hunch, I asked for Robert Jordan, but he wasn't available. Frustrated, I called home and got no answer. Both Sally and Robert's phones were turned off. I called Tony Jordan at the Chiswick office to ask where Robert was, pretending to need clarification on a contract. Tony took longer than necessary to respond. Oh, I believe Robert is in Brighton today, meeting with the directors of Carter's Industries. He led Sally to take notes. You know how Tony's memory works. You, lying jerk, made a bad move. That was the final contract I signed last week. It's already complete. What are you trying to pull? That was only a thought, not something I said aloud. When Tony asked how things were going, I told him that I might need a few more days to sort things out. As soon as I hung up, 
I called Monty Carter's secretary in Brighton, as I had suspected. She confirmed that there were no meetings scheduled with Robert that day, and she couldn't recall them ever having met. Patrick returned and urged me to hurry up and prepare for the conference, so I quickly finished my breakfast and jumped into the shower. We arrived slightly late, but no one seemed to notice. We began with a round of introductions and a tour of the office. We didn't enter the conference room until nearly one o'clock. I have to admit that my negotiations felt like a joke. Everyone agreed with everything I said and appeared more concerned about whether I was upset. Everyone seemed to agree with me about how useless and annoying the Jordan brothers were. However, no one said it directly. I assumed they were going to make me a great offer, but I was surprised when nothing came of it. Following the meeting, Paul, a few other directors, and I went to the roof to board the helicopter. Petra, as always, came along. She asked when I wanted to return to England and scheduled a flight for later that day. On the golf course, I used my phone to call my secretary in Chiswick and inform her that I would be staying for a few more days. Petra overheard me, wanting everyone to believe I was still out of the country, and noticed my nervousness and concern. She inquired if anything was wrong, sensing my unease when calling England. I mentioned my concerns about a possible problem back home, alluding to personal difficulties. Petra assured me of her confidentiality and offered to help keep my return a secret so I could catch them in the act if my suspicions were correct. Petra understood my urgency and promised to handle any calls from England, so no one would know I was flying back that night. She assured me that, aside from Paul, she was the only one aware of my return and would delay anyone attempting to contact me. As I was speaking with Petra, I noticed Paul approaching. Petra gave him a subtle signal, and he turned to talk to the other players, allowing me to make my calls in private. Following the game, we went to PSG's mansion for dinner, where I saw PSG's daughter Beatrice again. Something seemed off. I'd known her for years, but she appeared uncomfortable around me that day. I couldn't figure out what was wrong, but it seemed like they knew something I didn't. I began to worry that telling Petra about my suspicions had been a mistake. We flew back to the company headquarters later that day in the helicopter, and Petra drove me to the airport. She had arranged for someone to collect my belongings from the Waldorf Astoria. The flight back to Heathrow went smoothly, but when we landed, a steward greeted me in the arrivals area and directed me to a service phone for an urgent call. John, it's Petra. We had everyone waiting for you on the phone after you left last night. Your wife called, and I told her you were in a meeting with Paul. Later, both Johnsons called separately, and I relayed the same message. Your wife called again, asking when you'd return home. I informed her that you were booked on the Saturday evening flight. Was that okay? Thank you, Petra. That should work. I'll call them later on my mobile and tell them the same thing. I appreciate your assistance. Stay in touch, John. I will notify you if anyone calls here again. So my wife called and seemed concerned about where I was. I wondered why she was suddenly so concerned. I booked a room at the Novotel near the airport and discovered that Hertz had already delivered the car I had ordered from New York. Because the company had an account with Hertz, it was the simplest choice. However, the car was reserved under my personal name. Not feeling tired, I decided to drive past my house. Sally's car was in the driveway and the house was dark. It was just after 4 a.m., so this was expected. I called the house phone from the call box at the end of our street, but there was no answer, so the voicemail system took over. I called four times, but no one answered, so I assumed Sally wasn't home. I parked the car and walked to the house. After quietly entering and quickly checking the area, I confirmed that it was empty. I decided it was best to wait for Sally's return. I made a pot of coffee and sat in the lounge. I hoped the coffee would help me stay awake, but it didn't. Just before 8 a.m., I was awakened by the loud exhaust of the Lamborghini. From the window, I saw Sally and Robert exit the yellow car and walk up to the house. Come in, Bobby. I'll take a quick shower and get dressed. Will you go into the kitchen and make some coffee? I need something to clear my mind. It was strange. They didn't notice me sitting in the lounge, despite the fact that the door was open. I suppose some people don't see what they don't expect. Sally bolted upstairs while Robert went into the kitchen. I overheard him rummaging through the cupboards before calling out to Sally. Where is your coffee maker, Sal? It's on the counter, she replied from upstairs. He replied, I can't find it. Sally came downstairs and said, 
You men are useless without a good woman around to help you. As she entered the kitchen, That is odd. It should be on the countertop. I don't believe I left it in there. Oh my God, what are you doing here? Sally had entered the lounge in search of the coffee maker and had finally noticed me. She was only wearing a skimpy bra and a thong, neither of which I had seen before. I was just sitting here waiting for my so-called faithful wife to return. I think I'm going to smash that slimy jerk's face in, I said, rising from my chair. Both Robert and Sally were stunned for a moment, believing I was still in the United States. Then Robert regained consciousness and attempted to flee. Unfortunately for him, our front door had a difficult night latch with a tricky lever. The more he yanked and pulled, the more anxious he became. I slammed him against the door and beat him. It appeared that he didn't know how to defend himself. Sally was screaming that it wasn't what it seemed and attempting to pull me away. Robert. I do not think I hit him as hard as I wanted to. Honestly, I am not a violent person by nature. When he attempted to curl up on the floor, I stopped hitting him. I'm sure others would have kicked him while he was down, but I couldn't do it. I turned the latch in the proper direction, opened the door, and pushed him outside without thinking. I also grabbed Sally and shoved her outside. I slammed the door shut and went to the lounge. This time, we're going straight to the liquor cabinet. Sally knocked and rang the doorbell for a bit. From the window, I saw Robert get back into his car and emerge with a travel blanket, most likely to cover Sally, who was barely dressed. Sally began yelling through the mail slot, insisting that everything was not as it appeared and begging to be let back in. I refused to argue, so I ignored her. Some neighbors had begun to watch from their doors and yards. Sally must have realized I was back in the lounge, so she began banging on one of the lounge windows, still shouting for me to let her in. Unfortunately, she struck the window too hard just as the police arrived. The window shattered and Sally cut her arm badly on the glass. It seemed like only moments later that a paramedic and an ambulance arrived. I'm guessing the police contacted them. I did not. A police officer knocked on the door and briefly spoke with Sally and Robert before approaching me to get my side of the story. I explained that I found my wife with another man in my home. The officer noted that the man claimed I had hit him, which I confirmed, adding that I had not struck my wife and had simply shown her the door. Another officer who had spoken with Sally and Robert stated that neither wanted to press charges and that there was no violence involved. However, Sally had a serious cut on her arm that required stitches and she needed hospital attire. I refused to provide them, instead suggesting that her boyfriend buy her some new clothes. The Lamborghini followed the ambulance away. I mentioned that I needed to contact both the window repair service and my lawyer. The officers fled, hoping never to return. My lawyer connected me with a colleague who handles divorces. She said she'd start the process but couldn't do much until we knew who Sally was going to hire as her lawyer. Everything depended on how Sally wanted to handle things. I noticed the police driving by several times that morning as I was putting Sally's clothes in trash bags into the garage. I assumed there must have been some kind of agreement between the police and Sally. They must have informed her that I had placed her belongings in the garage around 4 p.m. A different police car arrived, this time with only one officer remaining inside. Soon after, a Ford Transit van driven by one of the factory workers drove down the street and backed into my driveway. I opened the garage door with the remote and observed what was going on. Sally, her arm in a sling, exited the passenger seat alongside a woman from her office, while the man and woman loaded Sally's belongings into the van. I overheard Sally attempting to open the service door between the garage and the kitchen. When she found it locked, she approached and rang the front doorbell. John, John, we need to speak. You have it all wrong. Nothing happened between Robert and me. John, I know you are in there. Please, let us talk. You're making an enormous mistake, Sally called through the mail slot. I opened the door just enough to slam her handbag into her hands before closing it again. I'd already taken her credit cards and house keys. I watched Sally converse with the police officer who had gotten out of his car. He continued shrugging and shaking his head. After a while, he pointed to a spot on the ground, presumably telling Sally and her friends where to wait. Then he approached and knocked on the door. Sir, your wife wants to talk to you. You cannot keep her out of the house. He said, when I open the door, you can tell her there is nothing to discuss. The house is on the market because she has decided it is no longer our home. If it were true, 
She would have come here last night rather than with her boyfriend. Tell her to have her lawyer contact me. She knows who they are. The officer returned to the driveway and had a brief but animated conversation with Sally and her friends. Sally then appeared to collapse into her friend's arms, who helped her back into the van. They drove away, and the officer watched as the garage door slowly closed. He shrugged at one of the neighbors who had been watching, then returned to his car and drove away. About an hour later, Petra called. I told her what had happened, and she expressed her sympathy. She asked what I was going to do next, and I told her I was divorcing Sally and couldn't continue working for Jordan's. Petra insisted that I keep in touch with her and made me promise I would. She also mentioned that Simon Johnson would be contacting me and that I should stay in touch so he could locate me. Paul had already mentioned it. I wondered why Simon Johnson's visit was so significant. I didn't return to the Novotel until midnight. I couldn't bear to live in that house again. It contained too many painful memories. After breakfast the next morning, I called my secretary to see if Tony was available. She informed me that he would not be coming to the office that day and inquired as to why. I described everything to her. The news made her very upset. I believe she was crying while I spoke. She told me Tony had hinted that I might resign when I returned. She believed he stayed out of the office to avoid being present when I arrived. Tony's absence seemed odd. I assumed he'd enjoy firing me, especially after I fought with his brother. Robert is one of the company's directors and we were never romantically involved. Nothing appeared to make sense. The entire situation was confusing. First, my trip to New York. Tony had insisted that I go, but when I arrived, everyone at Johnson's appeared surprised to see me. Sure, there were a few late deliveries, but they didn't seem too concerned. Then there was Robert, pursuing Sally. Sure, she's attractive, but Robert typically dated younger women. Sally was at least five years older than him, and almost ten years older than his usual partners. Perhaps they fell in love after working so closely together. But I had my doubts about Robert doing that. I went to the office to collect my personal belongings. While I was there, I wiped the hard drives of both my company computer and my laptop, but only after copying everything onto zip drives. While I waited, I delivered my resignation letter, which my secretary had prepared for me, to the personnel officer. He arranged for my final salary and bonuses to be deposited into my bank account right away. The accounts department was initially hesitant, but changed their tune when they discovered who was resigning. Almost everyone in the office helped me move my belongings to the rental car or came out to say goodbye. I had left my company car securely locked in the garage at home. Before returning it, I wanted to ensure that I had received everything I was owed. That was pretty much it. I spent about a week at the Novotel looking for a suitable flat. The house sold quickly because it was in a desirable neighborhood, and I priced it accordingly. Regarding work, I decided to take a few months off to consider my next steps. I was still hoping Johnson's would make me an offer, so I didn't want to commit to anything else right away. I saw Sally a couple of times, and both encounters ended in heated arguments. Actually, the two times I called her a cheating little 403, she reacted angrily. We couldn't hold a civil conversation. I was surprised she didn't move in with Robert immediately. She didn't move in with him for months after I kicked her out. I'm not sure where she went in the meantime, but the guy I hired to keep an eye on her said she moved in with Robert shortly after our first major disagreement at the lawyer's office. The situation was so intense that they almost had to call the cops. Sally most likely realized there was no chance of reconciliation during that meeting. Our second major argument occurred when we signed the divorce papers. Sally, who appeared strange, was sitting at the table in a large winter coat, looking uncomfortable. My lawyer and I sat across from her as the terms of the settlement were read. Sally signed the papers, and they were placed in front of me. As I was about to sign, Sally asked John, Are you sure you want to do this? There are some things you should do. I interrupted her and asked my lawyer if I had just heard a cheating, lying little 403. Say something. Sally became enraged and called me names, so I quickly signed the papers and left the room without saying anything else. As I previously stated, I didn't want to get into a shouting match with her. A few weeks, perhaps a month after the divorce was finalized, Petra called to inform me that Simon Johnson would be arriving in Southampton that weekend. I made plans to meet him at a local hotel. After the formalities were completed, Simon and his wife spoke with me about their cruise. 
I couldn't shake the feeling that he was up to something, despite the fact that he was a long-time client. He was acting like a long-time friend. We exchanged condolences on Henry's death, and he expressed regret for what had happened between Sally and me. He apologized for not acting sooner, but he needed to respect Henry's wishes. This made me realize that he had been avoiding the real issue. Things became clearer when B entered the room. She greeted me with a hug and kiss on the cheek before handing Simon a briefcase. After that, she and Simon's wife left before he could open it. Okay, John, let's get down to business, Simon said. What did you think when Henry floated the company without giving you any shares? I was unsure how to respond. Well, it was his company, and he could do whatever he wanted with his money, I explained. But you helped him build it. According to what I know about Henry, you probably went above and beyond for him several times. I didn't respond, assuming he'd get to the point quickly. Did you know Henry owned a significant portion of Johnson's through offshore holding companies? Those same companies own a sizable portion of Jordan's shares. This was news to me, but I decided to remain silent and listen to what Simon had to say. Tell me, what did Henry tell you when he retired? He knew he didn't have much time. He asked me to try and keep his boys under control. But because I was not on the board, there was little I could do. Yes, I am sorry to say this, but Henry did it on purpose. He expected the boys to ruin the company within a year and did not want you involved in any of it. He was worried they'd try to blame you. You are aware that if a company fails due to poor management, directors may be barred from holding additional director positions, right? He expected the boys to deplete the company's resources quickly. These papers make you the primary shareholder in the holding companies. Essentially, they now belong to you. Simon placed a stack of papers on the table. And these papers contain information on all of Henry's numbered bank accounts. I was supposed to keep them until Jordan and Sons failed. But after what the brothers did to you, I believe you should have them now. Did you know that under their father's will the brothers could not fire you? Okay, I see you didn't. I suspect they set you and Sally up to force you to resign. He leaned back to look at me. You're a wealthy man now, but all of your money is in offshore accounts, so you'll need to figure out how to legally bring it back into the country. I can help with that. I have some creative accountants. My thoughts were racing. He had just informed me that Robert Jordan had seduced Sally and ruined my life just to get me out of this company. But why? You appear angry. I understand why. Henry never truly believed that the boys were his. Martha had a habit of cheating on him when he was away. He had DNA tests done years ago, and he thought at one point that he might be their father, even if they weren't his biological children. But he came to believe they knew he wasn't their biological father and that they gossiped about him behind his back. Henry always said you were more of a son to him, so he decided you would inherit all of his money. He believed the boys would destroy the company. I assume you want them to go bankrupt and broke, just like he did. But what about Jordan's employees? They will lose their jobs. No, not if a major American company takes over. Do you understand Henry's plan now? John Johnson's will cancel its contracts with Jordan's within the next week or so. Right after that, some offshore shareholders will sell a large number of Jordan's shares on the London Stock Exchange. This will lower the share price. The appropriate bank officials will be notified, and the company's loans will be called in. Then, a group will come in and buy the company's remaining assets from the banks. You can guess who will be the group's leader and main shareholder, but no one will know. You will then renegotiate your contracts with Johnson's. Perhaps you will eventually invite me to join your board. A merger between Johnson's and Jordan's could place you on Johnson's board as well. How does that sound, John? I don't understand it. Why didn't Henry simply leave the company to me from the start? He knew you'd be dealing with legal challenges to the will for many years. You were with Henry almost every day in his final years. And, you know, he was somewhat eccentric. He assumed the family would claim you wielded too much power over him. They also suspected he was hiding money abroad. They've spent a significant amount of time and money searching for it. That is why Henry left everything in my care. Anyone who checks where your money comes from will discover that it came from me. Plus, because I'm no longer with Johnson and partners, they cannot accuse us of insider trading. And I have been on that damn ship for the past six months. So here's where things are now. I am Simon Johnson Associates Joint Chairman. 
I have delegated responsibility for the American branch to Paul while I oversee operations in Europe. The Jordan brothers declared bankruptcy and are barred from serving as company directors for 10 years. They attempted to re-enter the business several times, but I had people keeping a close eye on them. Surprisingly, Robert married Sally. I believe he expected Sally to receive some of the money he suspected was coming to me. But since that money was officially transferred to me after Sally and I divorced, he had no chance. After they married, I went to court to stop her alimony payments. Following that, they received nothing from me. Their marriage lasted less than a year. I truly felt sorry for the twins Sally had with him. I believe they met in the office after I kicked her out, as the person I hired to watch her said they rarely met in the evenings. I doubt Robert paid her child support after he left her. You wonder about these things. I kept wondering how long Robert had been involved with Sally. She must have become pregnant shortly after our separation. I saw her pushing a stroller down Slough High Road just a year after I kicked her out. Robert was last heard from in southern Spain, where the pill squad was investigating him. Southern Spain is close to Morocco, so I'm sure he used fast boats to get around. That is why I tipped off the pill squad. Tony is apparently driving buses around London. Not the best job. His wife divorced him after learning about his affair. I am sure you can guess who told her. Tony's mother, Martha, is now living with him. Do I feel guilty about Martha's loss of income from Jordan and Sons? Really? The question is whether Martha felt guilty for cheating on Henry. You reap what you sow. Sally was living in a council flat in Slough, most likely on social benefits, when I last heard. Perhaps she is doing something else on the side. Sorry for the harsh thought, but that is how I feel. Once we started, things moved quickly. Paul and I made an excellent team. We were both trained by highly qualified professionals. Over the next few years, I was trained by Henry Jordan and Paul by Simon Johnson. We acquired a large number of other companies. Our companies merged to form a large multinational corporation. Now Paul and I have taken a step back and let our teams handle the majority of the work. Simon Johnson and his wife settled in England. He purchased a nice estate right next to mine. His daughter B and I spend time together, but we don't plan to marry. We have both been there before. B serves on the board alongside Paul, me, and Petra. We get along well. Petra ended up marrying Paul. His wife had died in a car accident years before. Paul and Petra finally got together after much deliberation. Paul claims that Petra married him because she was tired of waiting for me to ask her. You may wonder why I am living alone in this penthouse. There's been something missing in my life since. Well, you know when. I just live day by day. If a good investment opportunity arises, I will take it. But there must be more to life than making money. Now, a social worker has just handed me a letter from Sally. I quickly read it and then used the intercom on my desk. Colette, could you please find out if Beatrice is in the building and invite her to come up here as soon as possible? Yes, sir. I think she's in her office. I saw her earlier and have not seen her leave. B came to my door a few minutes later. I handed her the letter without saying anything. As she read it, she took deep breaths, indicating that she was upset by what she read. That nasty, spiteful little bitch. Did you know about it? Not at all. What are you planning to do? I have no choice here, B. I asked June Parsons, which hospital is Sally in Slough? General. And what is her condition? When I stopped by last night, they didn't have much information. She had taken a variety of pills, basically everything she had at home. They were able to pump her stomach, but they are not sure how long she was unconscious. The doctor said it would be a while before they knew more. What about the kids? I placed them with an emergency foster mother last night. She will take care of them today. I wanted to ask you what you wanted to do. Oh, I need to get that note. If she does not survive, the coroner must examine her body. That is fine. Make a copy for me, B, and return the original to Miss Parsons. Colette, contact the general manager of SLU Hospital right away. I use the intercom again. Soon the phone rang. Hello? Yes. Do you know who I am? I've got a question for you. How much is your hospital over budget this year? All right, here is the situation. You've got a patient named Sally. Sorry, June. What is Sally's last name? Sally Crawford and June Parsons replied. It was unexpected. Okay, you have a patient named Sally Crawford who is experiencing an overdose. If she survives, I'll send your hospital a one million pound check. If she doesn't, you'll get nothing. Got it? 
Good. I expect no shortcuts and no expense spared. Goodbye. Surely they're saying everything they can. I don't trust the bureaucrats that run our hospitals these days. They frequently try to cut costs. I just have my doubts. Anyway, offering one million pounds should ensure that Sally receives the best care possible. All right, let's go get my kids. June, I assume that is why you are here. Mrs. Crawford says in her letter that they are your children. I see no harm in transferring their care to you for the time being. But until a judge rules otherwise, they are still my responsibility. Do not worry. They will be well cared for. I'll keep you updated on their status. With your permission, we'll drive them to my house near Swindon. There will be plenty to do until we learn more about Sally. We can easily drive up the motorway in an hour to see her. I'm glad you think that way, Mr. Crawford. Let's keep things as they are between John and June. I'm confident the kids will feel more at ease if we keep things familiar. The three of us went to the basement parking garage. Miss Parsons joined B and me in the back of my limousine as we drove to Slough. Our first stop was at the hospital to check on Sally. The doctors were hesitant to say much at this early stage. June then led us to the foster home where the children were staying. B and I waited in the car as she spoke with them alone. After about ten minutes, she signaled for me to enter and B followed. Kay and Heather, this is your Uncle John. He will take care of you until your mother recovers. June is introduced. We decided to use the Uncle John title until we learned more about Sally's condition and how the girls would react to me. Hello, girls. This is my friend Beatrice. You can call her Auntie B. I mentioned that the ten-year-olds looked at both of us with suspicion. You will be staying with me at my country home while your mother recovers. There are horses to ride and a swimming pool, B explained. Where is our mom? Can we see her? Kay asked. Is she about to die? Heather added that the doctors are doing everything they can to help her. I mentioned that the girls still seemed wary. We saw her earlier, but if you want, we can go to the hospital and see how hard they're working to get her better. They might not let the kids see her, June observed. I'm confident they'll let these children in to see their mother. Simply remember the situation, I responded. We dropped June off at the station where she had parked her car. Then we went to the hospital, and as I expected, the rules were changed to allow the girls to enter the ICU. Surprisingly, the girls did not cry like I had expected. They were very resilient. B also saw a strong resemblance to me. I decided against the DNA tests I had considered. The drive to Wiltshire was relatively peaceful. Once the girls felt at ease in the limo, they began to explore its interior. They were thrilled at the prospect of watching TV while driving down the highway. Heather asked me as we exited the highway, Aren't you our dad? I saw no reason to deny it. Yes, I am. But I didn't know until now. If I had, you'd have seen me more frequently. We know. Mom informed us last week that she had never told you about us. We had no idea what she was planning, but she claimed she was mean to you and didn't tell you you were our father. She said you thought her other husband was our father, Heather explained. Kay added, she was crying. That's correct. Maybe someday your mother will explain why she did what she did. Do you think she will get better? Kay asked. I sincerely hope so. She does not want to get better. Heather said she wants to go to heaven. I can't believe it, especially with two wonderful children like you. B replied, Mom is tired. She works so hard and never has enough money. Well, she'll have enough money and won't have to work anymore. See that tiny house? The car approached my estate. When she's better, I'll ask your mother if she wants to live in that house. You two will be able to ride horses and swim in the pool at the big house. The girl's eyes widened as she gazed at the mansion where the car had stopped. The house staff rushed down to greet them. I knew they had prepared for the girl's arrival by setting up a guest room with twin beds. B and I were somewhat forgotten as the staff cared for the girls and led them away. That's a surprise, B remarked. I wonder why she didn't tell you they were yours. Sally must have gone to extraordinary lengths to conceal her pregnancy from me. Now that I think about it, she could have been present at our final meeting when we signed the divorce papers. She sat hunched over in a long coat on a warm day. I remember thinking it was unusual to wear such a coat. I'm curious why she hated me so much. After all, she had cheated. What did she expect when I discovered she was with that jerk? You'll have to ask her if she survived. The kids settled in nicely. The staff fussed over them, and they appeared to enjoy it. 
Every night, I tucked them into bed and told them stories about their mother and me, excluding the previous year. Two weeks later, I entered the room where Sally was sleeping. She had awoken with a clear mind for the first time the night before. I put the letter she had left in her hand and waited for her to awaken. I must have dozed off while waiting. The first thing she said was, Hello, John. I apologize. I looked at her and noticed she was staring at the letter in her hand. How are my girls doing? They are doing well. I left them at the swimming pool this morning. They are keeping my staff extremely busy. They're both lovely girls and a credit to you. B will deliver them here this afternoon. Thank you. I am sorry I kept them from you. It was foolish to act out of rage. Once I did it. I wasn't sure how to undo it. I can't think of a worse way to handle it than you did. I was desperate. You know, I owe thousands of pounds that I cannot repay. Robert left me with numerous debts, forcing me to sign for everything. I believe he married me because he was bankrupt and couldn't get credit. You don't have any debts anymore, Sally. I have paid them all off, and the lenders you borrowed from have gone out of business for good. Oh, you learned about them? That was not hard. They arrived at your apartment demanding money while one of my employees was collecting the rest of the girl's belongings. They were taken aback when he said they should return later. They will not bother you again. Why are you so kind to me the last time we saw each other? You. That happened a long time ago. Sally and I were still hurt. Now it's just a painful memory. Although I was deeply hurt by your letter, it will take me a long time to forgive you for keeping my girls away from me. I apologize. This is all I can say. As far as the girls know, we are now friends. We'll move you to my house tomorrow, if you agree. I've scheduled a couple of nurses to care for you there. Once you've fully recovered, you and the girls can move into one of the estate houses. That way, I can see them frequently. You aren't going to take my children away? I will not take their mother away from them. No. They love you. Perhaps even more than I did. But I'll make sure you never keep them from me again. I apologize. That is all I keep saying. But I sincerely apologize for all of my mistakes. I have one question to ask you, Sally. Why were you involved with that creep in the first place? Don't you think I've asked myself that question a thousand times over the last decade? I am not sure I have a clear answer. He worked on me very carefully for a long time. I understand why he did that. He told me when he realized the girls weren't his. It did not take him long. They look so much like you. He stated that they couldn't fire you due to their father's will. They were convinced that you had some of their father's money. They assumed you would use some of it to start your own business if you lost your job. They had private investigators watching you all the time. They were very upset when you went to Southampton and met Simon Johnson. A week later, the company's four largest contracts, including Johnson's, were canceled. But you knew what was coming, didn't you? I believe the bank's seizure of their assets shocked them. They did not expect that. Next, the police arrived at the house. Did you know that Robert charged almost everything to the company? We had nothing. There's no house, car, or anything. Robert and Tony were arrested for misusing company funds, but I have a feeling you were behind it. No, Sally, the law followed its own course without my assistance. However, Robert and Tony were paid exorbitant salaries. What did they do with all that money? I am not sure. They both enjoy playing the stock market, and Robert spent money like water in nightclubs. He also likes to gamble. I believe they had spent it all by the time they decided to kick you out of the company. They hoped you would reveal where you believed Henry had hidden the money. You still haven't explained why you became involved with that jerk. I was angry at you. Robert was extremely manipulative. He deceived me every time you were away by making small comments. He allowed me to overhear things that made me think. You had girlfriends everywhere. It's difficult to explain, but I'd hear him talking to Tony about nightclub expenses and other issues. Oh, I'm sure those were legitimate expenses, but it was the little comments he made to Tony over the phone that I wasn't supposed to hear. But did he mention that you had a new girl in New York or Rome and how much you spent on her? They convinced me that you met up with your girlfriends every time you went on a trip. But if you suspected I was cheating on you, why didn't you confront me? Because I couldn't make myself believe it. If I confronted you and you admitted the truth, what would I have done then? I was not as strong as you. I don't think I could have left and divorced you. I'd have ended up miserable. But as time passed, I began to doubt my beliefs. Then the play came up. You knew I wanted you to take me there. Well, Robert was there when you called to say you were heading to New York. 
He overheard our conversation and comforted me while I was crying. Then he drove me home so I could collect your bag, and then to the airport. We didn't return to work. Robert claimed I was too upset. We spent the entire afternoon talking by the river in Sunnydale. Following that, he took me to dinner and the play that evening. I think I drank too much. I realize it's not an excuse, but that night I ended up sleeping with him. I'm certain I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't drunk so much. But it's easy to say now. I was feeling very down that day, but Robert made me feel better. After all, my supposedly loving husband had just flown off to meet his girlfriend, or so I thought. I still believe that before Robert left, he told me everything about how they had set it up. If you hadn't arrived home that day, they had photographs of Robert and me together. They were planning to send them to you anonymously, Lee. I knew it was inappropriate to sleep with Robert, and if it helps, he wasn't particularly good in bed. Too selfish. I do not want to hear that, Sally. I apologize, but he was terrible at almost everything except hitting me. He got pretty good at it near the end. When you returned and found Robert and me together, I was furious. I'm not sure why, but it felt like you were setting me up. That girl informed me that you wouldn't be home until Sunday. That was a little tart. Petra. Yes, Petra. I was certain she was your girl. Over there. Well, she wasn't. Don't you think I've realized that now? But I assumed you set me up so you could catch and divorce me. That made me very angry. Oh, I suppose I was very angry with myself. I planned to tell you about the twins the day we signed the divorce papers. My idea was to sign the papers first. And then, before you sign, tell you about the babies. This way, it wouldn't appear that I was using them to persuade you to reconsider and accept me back. You would have had the option to sign or not. But you were still angry at me. I should have known then that you were not cheating on me. If you had been, you would not have been as upset with my actions. Instead, you called me a horrible name and I lost my temper. I apologize. Stop apologizing. Nothing can change what has already happened. Will you ever forgive me? Do you forgive me? That is a tough question. I may eventually forgive you, but I will never forget. However, there are two wonderful young girls involved, and we must think about them. I will be courteous to you, and I expect the same from you. You are the girl's mother, and I will be their loving father. Just don't bring any boyfriends to my house. There'll never be any boyfriends, ever, ever. It's been a long time, Sally. Sally eventually recovered and moved into the small house on the estate with the girls until they went to college. She died from cancer several years ago. I don't think she had enough strength to fight it all. I believe the pills from her overdose caused long-term damage. B and I ended up marrying. Do we love one another? I don't think I love Beatrice in the same way I did Sally. B and I are more like soulmates. We genuinely care about each other and enjoy spending time together. I suppose it is love but it is not the same as my relationship with Sally. The twins are now adults, married, and have their own children. B is known as Grandma, a position she believes she is too young for. Am I happy right now? It is a combination of yes and no. I wish I could have lived my life with the woman I loved. Now all I can do is put flowers on her grave. Every Sunday, Beatrice waits at the cemetery gate while I do that. Life goes on. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, leave a comment below with your thoughts on what happened. Take care.